I need to know everything Who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But I like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George I hop in the Porsche with five and a horse I'm ready for war I'm coming for throws To turn to a ghost I need to know everything Now you be surprised at the info you get Just by letting them talk So I'm letting them talk Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in science Then let them in talk up their body Another one body That's just how it go I got Hello and game. welcome to JK Plus One I am not your host, PTF He is, uh He's, uh, I don't know what he's doing, to be honest with you. Let me think about it for a second. I talked to him this morning. Uh, no, he's, uh, oh, he's healing. He like, he like, he like fell down or something at his house, uh, trying to feed his dog or, I don't know. He fell and so he had, he like hit his eye and his wife wouldn't let him go anywhere. <laughs> God. Uh, anyways, uh, I am Jonathan Kinchin. I am your host and I am super excited for our guest this week. This is, a, this is what they call a good get, right? Like, you know, it's like when you're, when you're doing these things, you're getting interviews, you're having people in, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, someone who's high profile, doesn't do a lot of these types of things, one of those moves. Uh, yeah, we accomplished that today. We have, we have Steve Asmussen. So um, fresh off of 10,000 wins. Um, and it's one of my favorite we've done. It's... Uh, he, he talks about Curlin and, and, and Rachel Alexandra and, and his, his family and uh, just some, so a couple of emotional moments. I'll go ahead and give you a heads up for that. Um, but I do, I, gotta, I do have to warn, we, Steve was driving uh, from fairgrounds to, to Oaklawn. There's a couple of parts where we lose him for a second, but, you know, what are you going to do, right? You know, Steve Asmussen says, hey, I can do it, but I'm going to be driving. You don't say... No, you're not. You pull over. <laughs> you say, yes, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So Steve uh, w- was awesome. We had a ton of fun. And uh, just wanted to remind everyone, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe, retweet, post. It's on YouTube as well, audio only. Uh, but make sure you're subscribing, sharing. Uh, this will be a fun one to kind of get circulating around. I think people will really enjoy it. Um, also want to thank our friends at Qatar Racing uh, for making this possible. Uh, Sheikh Fahad and the crew, thank you uh, for for the support. Um, looking forward to uh, some more Qatar racing runners here uh, popping up in the U.S. Let me see. Let me look at my little list here. Do I, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. All right. It's it's only Tuesday, so we don't have any entries yet for the weekend. So I'm sure there'll be something going on soon. Um, look, let's let's just get to Steve driving. And uh, let's, let's, let's see what uh, we can't find out about two of my favorite horses of all time, Curlin, Rachel Alexandra, but also I can't forget about my man, Matoli, Steve Asmussen. Steve, how are you doing? Doing great. You'll, you'll be proud of me. I got a story to tell you uh, what I did this morning. Um, I think there's a couple people in this industry that would appreciate a move I made today. Um, I was 4,000 miles away from locking in executive platinum for next year. And this morning I woke up in Saratoga. I, I, I went to the airport in Albany. I flew to DC and got right back in a plane and came right back just to make sure that I had executive platinum for next year. Kid, you cannot have enough perks when it comes to transportation. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I'd uh, imagine that there's a few trainers that have executive platinum and, and you have to be one of them. I'm, I'm definitely up there. I, uh, I have quite the airline background as my wife, Julie was a flight attendant for Delta for 19 years. And I actually, uh, enjoyed, uh, the spouse benefits, uh, for the first several years of our marriage. Did you now, did you use when she was flying, did you use the benefits to get to and from the track or was the standby too stressful for you? Uh, I would, uh, I would use the standby to go for training, you know, when you had multiple flights on a day, but if it was to go for a race or something like that, uh, no, I couldn't take that chance. So my mother, uh, retired from American Airlines. She worked there for like 28 years. And so, I mean, the first half of my life, I never, I didn't even know how to pay for a plane ticket. I only flew standby. Um, and now I'm, I just, I can't deal. I just, too, it's too stressful. And I end up spending $300 at the bar 
when I'm waiting for missed flights anyway. So I might as well just buy my plane ticket. Yeah, we uh, yeah, I uh I, I and over the last several years uh public transportation has changed considerably. Now, for those that are listening and I probably said this in the intro, you are driving from Fairgrounds to Oaklawn, correct? That is correct. Yes. How how long of a drive is that? 505 miles from racetrack to racetrack. And I'm sure that's exactly where you go, racetrack to racetrack. Um so on this podcast, I, I usually I try to get some inside info from some people that know the person I'm interviewing just to kind of get some funny stories. And uh, your friend Tom Lute gave me a funny story that, that, that has to do with you in a car. Um, he said that, that you guys won a grade one on Saturday at Saratoga. He couldn't remember who it was. And he said that you called him at midnight. He was in California. You called him at midnight and were driving from Saratoga to Churchill to watch training on Sunday morning. And then right after training, you were flying to Lone Star uh, to saddle a couple horses. And that was the day that, that Keith got his first win uh, on a horse that, that, that uh, Tom said that he was involved with. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I'm, I believe it was Volatile winning the Vanderbilt. In, there it is. Uh, it's Saratoga. And then, uh, you know, we were extremely excited about that. And then uh, I went, but it was during the pandemic and public, <laughs> you weren't wanting to fly at all at that time. And uh, obviously we uh, very fortunate or, you know, to win the, the grade one with volatile. Um, and then I wanted to get to Lone Star uh, because of Innisfilet, Gl- yeah, it was the horse that uh, we thought he had a good chance, and I'm more than happy that I made it for Keith's first win. Do you, you obviously, you have to like it in the car. You, you, you drive a lot. Oh, I, I do. I, I think I get a lot done. Um, really, you're, all, you're with horses. You're just trying to get them in the right spot. What's best for them? And you want to drive down the road and the isolation of it is, I think you, I believe I think a lot clearer, make a lot of plans and, you know, and it's, you know, all about execution. Just have a plan and execute it. Tom said when he was at at Vinery, uh, he used to plan his calls to you uh, on Sunday night. He knew you'd be in the car. And he said most, most owners wouldn't do that because, you don't have your stuff in front of you, but he said he would have 25 horses with you and you would just like, and you wouldn't give them like the generic, Oh, training. Well, you know, worked a half this morning. He said the amount of detail that you retained and were able, able to give him about the 25 horses or so that he had with you at one time was just astonishing. Has that always been, you know, kind of a trick you've had up your sleeve to kind of have a good memory like that? Or is it just, are you just that immersed uh, in, in these horses? I've been, complimented on knowing knowing the horses but that that is a hundred percent my job um i don't uh, take that for granted I, I do believe that the volume of horses that or the numbers has been greatly aided by working for my father and my parent mom and dad in laredo when they were starting young horses and it was you know a very sizable operation they have 150 or plus a yearling turning two-year-olds, and they are by pedigree only at that stage, not tattooed or chipped. So identifying horses, keeping them separate, it's probably a learned response because of the responsibility of having, you know, being around that number of horses when I was young. Do you, are, do you, are you, you know, I've seen a lot of trainers and talked to a lot of trainers that, that quickly remember their names. Um, uh, but there's a lot of trainers that, that will kind of just do the pedigree thing. And then, um, and then I've always been astonished by like people who can memorize the markings. How does your brain work when it comes to knowing your stock? I think it's like, uh, you couldn't describe it, like trying to describe the differences in your kids, but you know, which one they are. It's, they got to look, they have just a way of traveling, a way of carrying themselves. There is something that makes that horse them. And I think that the pressure, uh, like identifying now, you have so many checks and balances, it's easy. But so you, but have 
150 yearlings that aren't tattooed yet. I mean, it, it, that, that would be, that was the pressure of making sure who everybody was when you're introduced to them for the first time all at once. You know, say right after the September sale, you'd have 60 to 80 brand new horses you've never seen before come in and keeping those straight. So I, I think it's just something that I've adapted to or learned over time because you needed to. And I, I just and also the fact that I know absolutely nothing about anything other than horses. <laughs> Well, I, that that makes sense. Um, we'll talk about ten thousand because it's obviously uh, pretty damn cool. But let's kind of go back a little bit to where you just kind of touched on, which is Laredo. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Texas, and in Laredo, for those that aren't familiar, is all the way down at the bottom, uh, yep. and it's a it's a border town that uh, I would imagine when you were growing up there was significantly safer place to be than I think some people might consider it to be now. Um, uh, what, what, what's your connection to later to Laredo now? Do you, do you still get okay. back or? Oh, absolutely. It's um, story and story there. Um, I was born in South Dakota. I got one older brother, three and a half years, my senior. And my family got to Laredo, Texas, um, kind of <laughs> getting out of the weather um, with them doing what they do with horses and stuff. But um, I, when I, my, when my parents moved to Laredo, I was two. So that Laredo is what I know as far as growing up. Some of those in the, very, very good friends in Laredo. And my, my parents would be prouder than, you know, establishing they have there and there you, you'd mentioned growing up in Laredo and it, it's home to me I still uh, fortunate enough to go back uh, about once a month have dinner with the parents go out and see the prospects for our uh, two-year-olds for this year and uh, just mom and dad have made Laredo home and they're uh, enjoy the community and very proud of it but as you mentioned in the question, you know, being a border town, everything that's happened and the safety. But when I was in high school, as I mentioned, Cash, my older brother, he was three and a half. He's a little over three years older than me. He was lead and rider in New York at the time I was in high school. And they actually, be, that was before simulcasting. That's in the late 70s. And uh, they have a turf club in Nueva Laredo. So the lead and rider uh, in New York's little brother is a very popular person in a simulcast. <laughs> so I, I would, I must admit, I had several free Cokes and uh, plates of nachos and chicken enchiladas when I was in high school. Just, uh, I would, he would, I would call him at the break from my dad's phone in the office at uh, Dick DeStacio's barn phone and ask him if he had anything that he liked. And then on days that he was felt very strongly about what he liked, I may or may not have went to the simulcast pavilion instead of school. <laughs> <laughs> was that an easy walk? How, how far was that? Did you just walk across or how did, how, how oh, was yeah. it? Back then? back then you drove across and the uh, Nuevo Laredo Turf Club was probably, you know, a quarter of a mile on the other side of the border. But yeah, oh, that that's was, amazing. Yes. Yeah, so we, uh, I, I greatly enjoyed living in Laredo at that time. And then so I, in the years that went past and we were training, one of my favorite stories about uh, Laredo and the safety or whatever, I guess back the USA Today had an article or something about how dangerous it had become there for something that had happened. And Jess Jackson uh, read the article or something and he called me and he wanted to uh, extend the fact that he would relocate my parents if he thought if they thought it was a safety issue or something. And my father's response to it is they're not killing anybody who isn't asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
<laughs> but you, when you're when you're in Laredo, you do not notice that. But I do understand some of the articles that have been written or since you know what they're saying. But I also yeah. am I also am not driving across to the turf club every week either. Yeah, and no, I, I went in college. I went to the University of Texas, uh, just like uh, just like Keith and and uh, we went down. And I, you know, I remember we said we're gonna go. Just we're gonna have some Coronas. We're not gonna get, we're not gonna stay too long. We're not gonna get too deep. And seven hours later, and people, friends losing shoes. I, we were we were very thankful to 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 get back without anyone going to jail or anything. But uh, right, uh, I I actually uh, <laughs> rode at Nuevo Laredo Downs when I had, uh, <laughs> my senior year in high school. But uh, they actually had a racetrack across the river. It was not. It was. It was not exactly Saratoga. No, I'd imagine so. Tell me a little bit about your riding career. I mean, I, I've always heard it, and you know, people will see you're 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 you're, you're a tall you're a tall fella to, to be riding a horse. That is, a, if it wasn't for Equibase, we would people would still think you're lying, right? But uh, no, I. Look, my brother is unbelievably successful and talented. And my dad, uh, if you've seen, you know, my parents, my dad's probably five, six, and my mom's not five foot. And I, you know, my older brother Cash rode and well into his 40s, or, you know, and then uh, here comes me. But it, at 16, I didn't think I was going to get too big. But by 17, it was quite obvious that was going to happen. But, uh, you know, my mom's side of the family has some pretty big people in it. And I, I obviously took after them. Now, you know, it's funny. I, I, I started going to Lone Star Park. That was the first racetrack that my dad took me to. We grew up in Grapevine. I, I've talked to you a little bit about growing up in the Metroplex just when, we, when I've seen you randomly. But I, I, you know, it's funny. When you go to a racetrack for the first time, you remember who the leading riders are and who the leading trainers are because when you're first figuring it out, you're trying to figure out why do these people keep winning so much? And that's kind of, you work backwards from there. Um, and I just remember you won every damn race at Lone Star Park. You and Eddie Martin Jr. Um, were, were, were just winning you know, all the time when I was that, there. How about, you know, Eddie works for me now. I mean, what a good guy. And he just loves his horses and, you know, he, he exercises regularly, and, and he just does it because he likes to be around them and for all the right reasons. And, he, you know, it's somebody who's had all the success that he did as a jockey. For him to – the ultimate reason we do this is simply loving horses. I, I've always wished and wanted and felt like it needed to be – a stronger circuit at Lone Star and, or, and, and it's, and, you know, it's just, it, I would imagine it's, it's, you know, kind of frustrating for you as well, kind of being your quote unquote home track. Does it, do, do you kind of wish that, that they would kind of, I feel like we can't get out of our own way in Texas uh, as far as horse racing. I think it's, uh, I feel very strongly about it, obviously, you know, uh, me and Julie have made a home there in Arlington, just, what are we, probably 10, 15 minutes from Lone Star Park. All three of the boys were born in Arlington. I mean, our memories of going to the track there. In, I mean, do you think of where you were when Reming, or when Lone Star opened and, you know, and where you, and what you developed into because of those opportunities? I feel that we owe a lot to the where we're at now because of the opportunities that we got at Lone Star Park, the lessons we've learned and continue to do so. And it's very frustrating that I cannot bet on horse racing from the same address my kids can bet on DraftKings legally. I mean, does that, I mean, how does that possibly make any sense? Oh, don't get me started. It, it's, exactly. It's... So it just, we, those we talk about what we don't know those things are above my head but the, that that there, there is just it, what it, amazing to me you mentioned you went to the university of texas and keith did went to the university of texas it's amazing how much his fraternity brothers and friends follow horse racing in austin texas with so little access to horse racing and, and yeah. the same situation is uh, darren at baylor with his friends and his 
you know, fraternity brothers and how much they know about horse racing and follow it with, I, I, you and I both know they are missing a huge demographic that they pretend to want. And it's and the thing about it that's that's frustrating for me is like it's it's we allow so many other things to take place. It's silly that we don't allow that. And um, you know, it, it, luckily, not luckily, it was annoying, but it worked out. When I was at Texas, Maynard Downs was still running. So on a big the day, home of my first win, really. My first win was a quarter horse named Ours Alone in uh, 1985 in uh, at Manor, Te- Manor Downs. That's unbelievable. It's yep. I, I I still I, if you're out there and you got a lot of money, I think you sh- that someone should buy Manor Downs. I tr- we we do real estate in Austin uh, and we tried. I read we tried to get it. For, we tried to buy it because I think you could turn it into like uh, something really cool in Austin. But nonetheless. Um, it uh, I, I had to like drive over there on big days when Giacomo won the Derby, and that was one of the, my first kind of scores. I drove over to Maynard Downs that morning, and it's just it's so silly. It, it's just a silly thing to, especially in this day and age, um, for them to not have access. Yeah, to think to think what we can see on our phone, you know, and you know, move anything you want, any series, anything you want, and you couldn't watch a live horse race. I mean, come on. I'm I'm with you, and the you grew up in Grapevine. You go to the University of Texas and look at what how your hours and your passion and how much is involved in horse racing, and for just and how I feel about it, and to think that there aren't other people out there that would have the same enthusiasm and effort in it is mistaken. And I my eyes were opened by. Uh, the the people that my uh, the kids that my my sons go to school uh, go to school with at the University of Baylor and the University of Texas and how much they follow horse racing I just me uh, me and Julie Keith and Eric drove drove to Waco this week for the sing competition and it was won by a Kentucky Derby themed uh, play or performance wow yeah it was a a play on uh, come on irene and it was come on 18. it was really nice that's awesome that's awesome yeah it's and it's like and and these kids too you you know they i say these kids i'm allowed to do that now i think i know we're allowed to say that now right um you know these kids you know, I remember when I was in school, I, I just got really interested and in gambling was fun. Poker was really booming. And so poker and you got into like betting strategy with poker. And then, then you're like, okay, where can I apply this and other things? And then that's when I, you know, racing. And then, but these kids, like they are, they've been well exposed to it with all of the, the, the gambling conversations that happen on social media and, and gambling in sports now and, 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 and poker and, and draft Kings, like you mentioned. And it's like, and yeah, pre- but you right. Know. And for us to pretend that that's not their interests and those aren't going to be the successful people going forward, I, you know, being uh, coming from there and to witness it uh, there, <laughs> right. you would think that would be a market that racing would want to cultivate. Huh? Y- yeah. Young, young professionals that'll gamble that are most likely going to own businesses. Wouldn't want anything to do with them, would you? No, no. Um, back to Lone Star Park, uh, another funny story I'll tell you, and then we'll, it's going to be a natural transition into a, a horse I'm sure you could talk about for days, but I, you know, I was hanging out at Lone Star Park and I, I feel like it was the week prior to the Derby in the Oaks, uh, Rachel Alexandra's Oaks. And you were walking out of the kind of the pavilion, you know, like at the sixth, uh, I guess it's like the, probably the eighth pole at Lone Star Park, uh, the simulcast building. You're walking out of there. And just a fan, I walked up to you and I said, hey, Steve, how good do you think that Rachel Alexandra is? And and, and you looked at me and you're like, I, I think she might be pretty good. And then I laugh at that because a few weeks later, you, know, you were putting a, a bridle on her. Um, she is still, I have her tattooed on my arm. She's still one of the most majestic, magical, heart-wrenching lump in my throat horses I have ever watched run in my life. Tell me what Rachel meant to you. 
Oh my God. It's, you talk about that. The hair on my arm stands up. I, how to put into words. I, I remember watching her work one day at Saratoga and I think she levitated. I literally think she wasn't touching the ground. It was, it was magical. I mean, absolutely. She was magical and carried herself like it. She knew it. She, you know, you were just allowed to be around her, but it was all her. Uh, it was the more it, it was, I think magical is the exact definition of who she is. And the three-year-old Philly year that she put in and what my memories of that were the summer of Rachel Alexander and her three-year-old year and running in the Haskell and beating the boy, you know, the three-year-old Philly against older boys in a grade one at Saratoga. The part, it was raining every day. You know, What you're wanting to do with her in the morning and work and, man, you couldn't close your eyes for the raindrops on the roof. I mean, I was tight, to say the least. I was anxious, but it did she separated herself from all of those natural uh, obstacles and just did it anyway. It was ama- It was truly amazing. Now, on the morning of May 2nd, which is the, the day, uh, 2009, which is the day after the Kentucky Oaks, did, I mean, did Jess, I mean, did Jess call you? Did you know already? Did you know this was something that could happen? It, like, tell me about those two weeks between the Oaks and the Preakness and when you actually found out you had a chance to get her and how you were, if you were involved in the decision-making process. Uh, John Moynihan put it together. He, he put it together. Um, and we uh, facilitated the getting her vetted and contacts together, but John Moynihan put all of that together. Um, just like he had with uh, Curlin. And we were the unbelievable beneficiaries of of that transaction. How quickly did she get into your barn? Did you, I mean, did you have her like... Monday morning. Monday morning. Yep. Wow. Yep, Monday morning. And when she stepped... And then then the anxiousness of... You know, and she was purchased to prove she could beat the boys in the Preakness because Jess rightfully thought she was better than they were. And she was not a Triple Crown nominee. And if the race would have overfilled, she would have not been in the race because it was nominees preferred, even in, even when they paid the supplement. And that came down to the race day draw. And I believe if uh, not for Mary Lou Whitney of uh, not entering, she would have been excluded. Do, do you, have you, did you ever hear, did Mary Lou do that intentionally or, or. Oh no. So that she could, so that she could Ab- I, I she made, you know, made the statement of the Philly deserves to run and she wants to see her run, you know, and it was, you know, she just, a sportswoman like she was uh, wanted to see Rachel in the race. When you saw those early fractions in the Preakness and you saw a big drama who went on to be a Breeders' Cup sprint champion, were you concerned or take a deep breath? I mean, you didn't know her that well. So, I mean, you knew her, but not intimately throughout her entire career. Were you concerned at that early part of the race in the Preakness? My, uh, my experience with her, with her was so unbelievably unique because of the whirlwind of the 11 because of the 11 days previous of her of uh, moving into the barn settling in she just settled straight in she ate her appetite was fabulous you know she get, had a tremendous amount of confidence about her and then of the about the nominees, are you getting in? And then the post draw and dry 13. There was so many things that you were focused on or worried about. And the moment we walked out of the barn to walk to the paddock, it was an experience I'd never had before in horse race. I never was a part of a horse that every single person you saw or were in attendance of was on her side. It, it, like no other horse I w- I've ever been involved with, 
they everybody was pulling for Rachel in a way that I'd never experienced in racing. So the race itself, that was the feeling. It just how much everybody loved Rachel Alexandra. Now, after the Haskell, um, or, well, I guess the, the first question is between the Haskell, was the Haskell or the Travers ever a conversation or were you, were you always thinking the mile and an eighth for the Haskell? We were, we were thinking the Haskell to, to be, you know, um, we were definitely thinking the Haskell as far as a good fit for her and off of the mother, the timing of the mother goose and the unbelievable race she ran there. It was a natural fit. The, after she won the Haskell, Jess, who loved, loved challenges. I mean, he was alive for the challenge, running her in the Woodward against older males instead of beating who she'd already beat before, which proved nothing to him, was, was the goal. So the Haskell was after the whirlwind of the Preakness and the 11 days, getting her back, getting in the rhythm that you wanted to. We used the Mother Goose to see how she runs for us because the Preakness was Hal Wiggins training and he did a wonderful job with her just like the Oaks. We just carried the ball. But bringing her back for the Mother Goose, how does she respond to us? And we used the Mother Goose as the prep, prep for the Haskell distance, timing, everything. And obviously we had a lot of confidence going into the Haskell, but Jess and the sportsman that he was, it was, and Barbara, of course, what hasn't, she, you know, <laughs> run it against older males. And then, as I've already mentioned before, wanting to prepare for the Woodward and it raining every day that summer. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to ask you what you think would have happened. That's not fair. Do you wish that Zenyatta and Rachel would have gotten to get into a gate together at some point? Or oh. is it not something that you've ever really, ah, whatever, it didn't happen, no big deal? Or do you wish it, it would have happened at least once? Oh, of course I do. Of course I do. And, and how do you say that with nothing but admiration for who the horses are? Whenever, I think a very un fair question in all race horses is when you compare them against somebody they didn't get to run against right. what how they compete how they lift their game who they are on the racetrack is what makes them champions not not a morning workout or not not against uh, your main competition so i i of, of course but nothing but respect for who they are you know, I, look, I loved them both. I, I loved them both. And I, 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 the one thing is, is as a, as a handicapper, as a horse player, I am speed kills. And as much as I loved Zenyatta and, and, and I, I don't know what would have happened. I think a lot of it would have been circumstance. They probably could have raced against each other 10 times and there would have been a, a lot of different outcomes, but you know, Rachel, just one thing that she had that is just so damn dangerous is she made her own trip and she would run and she would do it quickly she's not one of those 48 to the half types she was a 46 to the half type get everyone else off the bridle how about the, how about the woodward how about the woodward territory you talk about you was i concerned about the pace and the freakness <laughs> how about how about it's rained every day since since the haskell and, and tom durkin it is thunderous and rich Forty, they're not going to give it to her today. I'll be like, oh my god, <laughs> they're sure not. <laughs> now that that was weak at the knee moment right there. Now you, I've seen you watch at Saratoga. You watch from the apron very often. Um, did you watch Rachel from the apron? No, I watched her from the from the box. I did. I watched her from Bill Heidelbro's box, which is about the sixteenth hole, and right up front and. There was too many people to see that day. So I had to go up to the box. I love watching races from the apron. I think everything else you can watch on a replay. But, man, there is nothing like the eye on one or how desperately they got to the eighth pole on what you would want to change. 
and how comfortable they are. And I just, I love watching races from the head of the stretch between the three sixteenth pole and the eighth pole. Now, do you, I mean, that's, I, it's, I can always tell who's going to win from there. I can't, the pan is too hard. I can't, you just can't tell from the pan shot. Um, now, but what about the first part of the race? Are you just trying to watch it on the screen? I, you can watch that. What you could see from up higher, you that is the replay. You you know between the replay and the head on, you'll do all that. I just think the important part, the important part is the middle of a race for one. That's what you can change. You're not going to change how fast they are, but you can you can change how much energy and how comfortable they get. You know they are in the middle of a race. Mm. Yeah, and how much how much they got left? I mean, a lot of it is they're not all doing all they can do all the time, you know. And what do you need to? What do I need to do different to have their state of mind one that they want to be more generous? Well, that's 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 an interesting way to to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I, it's I think you know it's funny. I, I I coached high school football for seven years, and I had to learn when I was up in the booth and I had jobs to, you know, to report to my offensive coordinator, what coverage they're in, things like that. I used to have a hard time not watching the play because I was a fan of the game. I was a fan of our team. I wanted us to do well. So I'm watching the quarterback drop back and the, the coach would ask me, what did they do in the back end? And I'd be like, Oh, coach, I didn't, I didn't see it. I, <laughs> and it, this is, this is kind of reminding me of that. It's like, I, I know it's a lot more fun to watch them going into the first term. Um, but it's not, it doesn't allow you to do your job as well. I, I think the unbelievable opportunities like Curlin and, and Rachel Alexander and how much they teach you that you were in my position ignorant to, because I'd never been exposed to that level of talent. What separates them? I think that the lessons learned by that you can apply that I think that the gun runners that come along a little later and you noticed how the middle of the race separated gun runner from everybody else in, in a way that just made it equinely impossible for them to keep pace with him. And it was, and it was that, uh, how fast he went and how, the amount of energy he expelled to do that. Literally the expression, he ran them off their feet. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's one of those horses to me that like, and, and I, I thought he was a really darn good three-year-old, very similar to frosted. I thought frosted was a really darn good three-year-old, but then they just turned into monsters when they turned into four-year-old. I mean, how, how do you think that, I mean, is there, in your opinion, is there, is there, that big of a difference between a three-year-old and a four-year-old? Well, I think it's extremely individual. I think it, and I, I think you can relate it to people, you know, and, uh, you know, some people physically uh, as talented as they're ever going to be in junior high, some as physically talented as they're ever going to be in high school, some not until college, you know, and, I think that that's why all five-star recruits don't make it to the NFL because uh, maybe the, they've already seen their best. But I do believe that Gunrunner is a perfect example of elite ability and a time scale that did nothing but improve. He and, and he's obviously off to an outstanding start uh, as a stallion, and 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 he's he's gotten you uh, a couple of nice ones as well. Um, th that's got to be a blast. I I, I got to feel like it's got to be like grandkids uh, coming into the barn. Yeah, uh, unbelievable! It's the gun runners are. I think David Fisk, you know, uh, Winchell's forever. Uh, farm manager, uh, racing manager, set of best. The, these, uh, these mares uh, gave, gave us, uh, you know, good horses and the gun runners out of the same mares are great horses. He has just elevated, elevated our game and they take racing. 
they're unbelievably sound and they have a tremendous amount of ability. It's unbelievable. It really is. I think that, you know, Echo Zulu is a freak. I mean, and then you, you know, somebody like Gunite and the, the mental toughness of that, of Gunite as an example, when you're, you know, it's very important in horse racing to prove stallions. It, it in it is the financial part of the game, and we're Winchell three chimneys. Everything Gunrunner did for us on the racetrack, we're you know obviously. But that when they go to stud, it's a whole different game. And then we got young Gunrunners that we like, you know, looking back. But we we need to prove it, and. Gunite was out of a nice sprint family of Winchells that had had solid runners, um, listed stake winners, solid runners, and identified him as somebody to be aggressive with. And, you know, one of the first advertisings for Gunrunner. And for him to be run as often as he was early, have the two year old year he did, win in the uh, second in the Saratoga special, win in the hopeful. The year he did last year as a three-year-old, and now he's still, you know, his solid second in the South, in the Riyadh Sprint. You don't get away with that with normal horses with that level of pressure, that many fast races. I mean, they, they I mean that that I believe proves that there's more on them, more in them on the inside than your typical racehorse, even your talented racehorse. It's, it's more than just their ability. It's their state of mind and their competitiveness. I mean, Ron's had a hell of a run with, uh, with, with stallions. I mean, he's the, he's, oh he, I mean, does he not have two of the best in the world? One of them, um, who I think was celebrating a birthday recently with Tappet. It. Uh, it's a okay, hell of a run. I, I believe Tappet is the number all time money winning sire, right? All-time money-winning sire, I believe, you know, and Gunrunner is broke every record of a horse that age. So, yeah, that's a pretty good start. I mean, that's got to be that's that's got to be. I mean, I know a lot of people have hit the lottery with, uh, you know, really rich owners and, you know, and that, that spend a lot of money. And, you know, I mean, you know, Todd does really well with Micro Poli, but. Man, when you got one that's throwing out homebreds and has stallion shares to, to those two, that's a pretty good position to be in as well. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with it's better in a pretty good position. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll go with that. Yeah. Um, so the, the one thing I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Curlin, obviously, uh, before we get away too far away from Rachel, because I feel like they need to be talked about in a – in a similar situation, it, you know, Curlin obviously was was an outstanding animal. Um, tell me a little bit about Curlin, and then I got some follow up stuff on him. Um, Curlin carried a, a carried us to where we're at. He, my most personal story about Curlin was after he got beat in his last race in the Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita on the synthetic. And I, I just, nothing tore you up like that, knowing it was his last race and his winning the Preakness and being the first horse to make 10 million and the Dubai World Cup and the three-year-old year when he won the Breeders' Cup Classic at Monmouth. I mean, just things that are just mythical that he did for us. And I, I just couldn't sleep that night. You know, it just, um, having Curlin run on synthetic would be like telling Michelangelo what colors to use on a painting. You know, it just, <laughs> it, I, there's never been as strong of a horse mentally or phys as Curlin in every way he is Alpha, the definition of it. And he intimidated other horses like you've never seen before. Um, I'm rambling a bit, but so many stories hit me at the same time. But I remember how bad I felt. I didn't sleep a wink, and I couldn't 
get to the barn soon enough over this overwhelming feeling I had of how much I appreciated Curlin for everything that he had done for me and my family. And I get there and I look at him and I'm from the bottom of my heart. He just, he looked right through me and just simply let me know how it was always him and that I was just along for the ride. That's amazing. And it, he, that horse, that horse is so amazing to me that I, I have a hard time going and visiting. Was it, it, it did it, was it a lot? I mean, you, you say how much he meant to the family, but I think I'm, I'm getting this impression that it's, it's something about him as an individual and, and his kind of his mindset and his courage is it, it, what it feels like is what's moving you so much. I wouldn't be capable of what I'm capable of if it was if he wouldn't have been a part of my process. Um. He introduced me, showed me, taught me um, things that would not have been possible if not for my exposure to him. And it was separate. I mean, I, I have these stories because I was allowed to live it. And his three-year-old, year, when he was, when John Moynihan bought him, for the partnership that he put together, which was Stone Street of Jess Jackson and Barbara Banky, Padua Stable, Satish Sinan, George Bolton, and then Midnight Cry stayed in for, and they all, they, they did not have equal percentages of the horse. And, but they were all in on the horse. And then the unbelievable, he, he came off a maiden win, he came to the fairgrounds, and at this point in the year, you're breaking your maiden in February, and he is who he is. Our choice for first race for him is the Rebel after we train him for a while. But he was more than just a bit of a handful on the racetrack. I mean, he was strong minded, strong willed, and he did not do things just because you wanted him to do things. He was, and I breezed, we worked him a couple of times. And at the time, uh, Donnie Mesh was riding a lot of horses for us in Louisiana. And Carlos was uh, working for us at the time also, you know, uh, Carmen Rosa's long time exercise rider, just some greatest horses of all time. Um, Carlos worked him a couple of times and it was less than the greatest thing you've ever seen the first two times we worked him. At the time I had a uh, appealing Zofi who'd won the spin away and a horse called Zanero who had run second in the Remsen in his previous out and both of them were returning for their three year old season um, and both going to prep uh, their first preps of the year. We're going to be at the fairgrounds in the, I believe the silver bullet day and the uh, Lecomp or risen, whatever names their first preps at, you know, the January preps or the March preps had at the time in Louisiana. And they were working solidly. And I had, I put Donnie on Curlin in behind appealing Zofie and Zanero and told him, the eight pull wheel him out and it's time for him to pick it up. It was eye opening. It was. And then he, we took him up from there to the rebel and he won. And then obviously the Arkansas Derby and then his three year old year culminating with a, a win in the breeders cup classic. But what was amazing about Curlin was 
that talked about how he intimidated other horses. Um, him getting beat in the Haskell taught us to sh he needs to show him how good he needs to be or what he needs to be up to. <laughs> Believe me, there was more than just a little debate about running him against Lawyer Ron in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. But Jess believed in Curlin and believed in me and had the majority of the horse. And I wasn't positive he would beat Lawyer Ron in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, but I was positive if we let him see how good he needed to be, he would beat him in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And you can, well, the Jockey Club Gold Cup, at the time, Lawyer Ron was the horse coming off, I think, like some crazy buyer that he had run at Saratoga and was a prohibitive favorite in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. And for us to run in that race off getting beat in the Haskell was ambitious, to say the least. But it was. I just had the ultimate confidence that if I if we showed Curlin what he needed to do, he would be up to it. And the weather at Monmouth was a variable that definitely had me nervous. And I remember Scott leading Curlin over and by design waiting in the holding barn. The holding going over to the holding barn. He dropped him in walking around, dropped him right in behind lawyer Ron walking in the Holden barn. And when we got to the paddock, lawyer Ron didn't want saddled and Curlin won. So, okay. So I, I this is, there's a lot to unpack here. So, <laughs> so I want to ask you, but I'll come back to it. Cause this is too good. I want to ask you what you meant by like showing him what he needed to do. But so you guys intentionally got close to lawyer, to lawyer Ron in no, the no, no, showing him what he, he, he wasn't a generous training horse. Uh, um, all of those, when we worked him, when we first got him, I think that he was not, he did not impress you. When I gave him my best three-year-olds and asked him, he would be up to the task, but to be prepared for what you do. When you talk about what Curlin taught me and how emotional I am about him, it was separate, different, nothing compares to but you when he is that alpha you have the responsibility of showing him what he's going to need to do and showing him what do most horses or lesser horses i should say would be giving them an easy prep before their big race being the classic everything was on the line in that year's classic you know with street sense and you know rags to riches and lawyer ron and you know him winning the preakness i mean he wasn't the favorite in that year's classic and choosing to run against lawyer ron who seemed unbeatable in the older division in the jockey club gold cup was to i just thoroughly believe that curlin would raise his game so there's somebody out there that can go that fast i will do better you under, do you understand what yeah, I mean by No, showing? I get it now, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Like, and, and, and also, I think what you're also saying here is, like, if you would have given him a soft prep, you wouldn't have gotten to the bottom of him. But you knew that in the Jockey Club Gold Cup running against Lawyer Ron, you would get to the bottom of him to really have him ready for the Classic. I don't think there was a bottom to Curlin. There was no getting to the bottom of Curlin. There is no getting to the bottom of the Curlin. He is the exception. What, I, what I'm saying is, this is how fast you're going to need to be. Mm -hmm. If you, if, if, and he was, he was not a generous horse in the morning at all. With that being said, another story that I have about him was, I mentioned Zanero. Zanero, his last race, his three-year-old year, was the Indiana Derby, which he won handily. Debated whether we run him in the mile or not in Breeders' Cup, but Ron de, uh, and David decided we're going to run him as a four-year-old. So we gave him that time off, and then we were bringing him back for his four-year-old year at the fairground. Uh, 
Curlin had won the classic. We're bringing them back. They've breezed two or three times off a little freshening. You know, they have a little five eights. I just, you know, I think it's time we're going to put them in company and go five eighths of a mile. They go two and change, you know, one or two and three. Easy, I mean, easy for both of them, you know, very easy work for both of them. Zanero did not want to cool out. I mean, he was, he just simply told me from all of his working with Curlin the whole three year old year was, I had that job last year. I do not want that job this year. It was, <laughs> it was, it was the funniest thing. I mean, it was so within what Zanero's capable of doing, but it's like, I've seen enough of that red horse. You just keep him away from me. You know, it, it was, it was, it was that obvious. I mean, when I, if, if anybody believes that I know anything about a horse, I'm telling you, Curlin is different than all other horses. Now, I, 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 I do not want to bring this up as like a bad moment, but I'm just curious. So in the Belmont, when, when he got kind of hooked with rags to riches, what, you know, being this kind of alpha that he was, were you surprised that day that he that he let her get by him? I don't think, I don't think she got by him. I thought they finished up in under forty eight the last half mile of the race, and I think that's another example of. I don't think they could ever get her to work again after that. Right. I think they ran her one more time, and she was beat by a filly and that was it i mean you i think he got to the end of everybody i mean i think that's another another example of once maybe once but never twice but I, they went you know the what three quarters you know the way the race unfolded and set up and she just maintained it to the wire i'm surprised she stayed in front of him you know from her position but she left it all there. She didn't want any more. Yeah, yeah. Now, Stephen, I got to ask because it's. I'd imagine that it's you know it's it's a uh, the, the you've got all these unbelievable accomplishments that I, I'd be very interested to see if are ever surpassed. Ten thousand wins, so on and so forth, and you're not done yet. Um, you know, but look, I we, we all know that, that the Kentucky Derby's got to be high on your list of of, of things that you still want to accomplish. That when it comes to curling. Uh, do you have anything about that derby that you, ah, I wish this, ah, I wish that, or was it just racing luck? He's had a bad trip. I, I thought I keep blaming it on fate. I don't know if that's just my easy way out or what, but to imagine that I've not won the derby with Curlin, Gunrunner, and Epicenter. Wow. I got an obstacle, but I, <laughs> what, I mean, is that even possible? I mean, I think on the with Curlin, um, you know, streets. I don't know how how he didn't. You know that is doesn't seem possible, but yet there it is. I, I'm going to go with the, they're so sure of the outcome they'll let you bet on it. Is the only reason I got there. <laughs> no, it, 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 the level of confidence Curlin gave me. It was uh, you know is is impossible to measure. I, I obviously think that he's capable of anything. Uh, uh, Tom Lute gave me another funny one after the Preakness. He said that you guys were uh, at Phasic Tip to uh, Timonium, and you're you're standing there, and you looked over at him, and and uh, he, he you know he he said he always likes to bust your balls about how you're a sicko and. And how you, you just you can't turn it off. And he said, uh, you said to him how crazy this game is because I won the Preakness last night, and here we are looking at seventy-five to hundred thousand dollar two-year-olds at Phasic Tip and Timonium. Well, I mean, I I think it's quite safe to say we've all identified ourselves as having a little uh, sickness <laughs> or addiction to horse racing because of a lot of what what the funny one of my funnier memories about winning the Preakness was I did go to the Timonium sale, right? But it was I did right after that we went to the Timonium sale and just trying to get my expectations back to reality and then and I think the the following week or something like on a Tuesday, um, we. Scott and Darren, uh, 
you know, some longtime assistants had an unbelievable starter horse named Golden Hair that won like 20 of 24 races for him. And we drove up, uh, I drove up to Indiana and it was uh, to run him in a starters five on the turf with uh, Parker Buckley, who worked for us at the time, exercise horses riding him. And I look, at, I'm waiting, at, uh, I'm at the paddock and walking him into the paddock where Felix and Scott, the exact same two people who led Curlin over for the Preakness for this starters five on Tuesday at Indiana Downs. It was, yeah, we're sick. Yeah, it's no doubt about it. Well, I, look, it's, it's I, I, I love it. It's one of the things, uh, you know, it's, I love, it's easy. It's an easy story to tell my son when I see someone who has success that works hard and and has never gotten to you know kind of big for their britches and it's like i, I you know i i remember in the summer at one point I, I i don't remember if it was when you were trying to break dale Bra- uh, baird's record and and it's like you were you know we saw you at saratoga the day before for a grade one and then a couple of days later you're at lone star on the end of the shank and it's it it's surely steve's got someone that can handle that for him and it's you're very, very hands-on. I I will say I, I miss that part of it the most about being who I am. I mean, you just, I mean, the reason that we're doing this or is the is to be the the contact, you know, what you get from them. You know, I mean, it's why people ride horses for ribbons. I mean, it's the contact. And I... I grew up, it was so funny because somebody sent me last night a video from 1978 of the All-American Fraternity. And I watched it, my parents, my mom, and dad, they had the favorite who ended up fourth. It kind of felt like watch. I was the groom of the horse and it was me walking him over, you know, in the background and stuff. And it was so, you know, that that's who I am. You know, that's where I came from. That's who you want to be. And it's the physical contact with these horses that's the great part. An- another good story uh, that, that Tom Tom helped me out a little bit. He, this is, uh, he actually told me this one at one time before, so he just reminded me of it. But it was about Regally Ready. And uh, I-, I won't tell the whole story. Hopefully, you'll. Re- I- I'm assuming you'll remember. I'll let you tell most of it. But it was about the fact that you couldn't get him a gate card. Oh, and- my goodness. And uh, and uh, and Tom said, geld him. And and he said, we won't tell the owner yet. Let's just geld him first. We can't reverse it. He was he would lay down in the gates when he was a stud. He just he would get in there and lay on the side. Unbelievably touchy. He was a very unique personality and uh, gilded him. And he still wasn't fabulous away from the gates when we first started him and but once he got to racing and his ability took over, he was, he ended up winning 20 races for us. What a nice horse. What a nice horse Regally Radios. That's funny. So so he, he then it, it reminded him of another story where you guys were, he said he, he you were in the paddock at Saratoga. It was a, a, a two-year-old turf race was coming up. And he was with a bunch of his buddies, the, the guys that work at Tito's. And he, you know, he, he, he was kind of, you know, Tom is, he's, uh, he's the ultimate ball buster. He says to you that, uh, and, well, he, and by the way, yeah, by the way, he was, I remember this vividly and he may have left out the part that he was sauced when he was, <laughs> as you put it, busting my balls. Yeah. Drunk Tom was teasing about how I can't win on the turf. And I said, that can only be said by somebody I've won a Breeders' Cup turf race for. <laughs> yes, there you go. There yeah. you go. That's that's exactly what happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm getting razzed, and, and uh, what a memory he doesn't have, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I forgot about He forgot about that one, the purple hat yeah. and the little trophy. That one slipped yeah, his mind. Yeah, exactly. That exactly. one slipped his mind. Um. Steve, is there a sneaky race, you know, a sneaky one outside of, you know, the bigger ones? Is there a sneaky race that you've always wanted to win that you haven't won? <laughs> uh, I, I, it's the Derby. And I, I last year, I, I was I, epicenter and 
the race and the ride Joel gave everything and he didn't win, that walk back was like, that was an are, are you kidding me moment. I watched, I just, I felt when they were walking in the gates, I couldn't have been any more confident. Uh, it just, this is, it's now. I mean, it just felt so positive. And Zandan was who I thought was the horse to beat in the race, just watching them train and being there. And I thought Pratt gave Zandan a dream trip. I thought Joel did perfectly with Epicenter, you know, with the pace scenario. And Pratt stayed right on, stayed covered up on him. Joel moved out. Pratt took advantage of that and brought Zandan out with a winning move. And Epicenter fought him back in that feeling of, how I was concentrating on it and watching it, it felt at that exact moment like it had happened. <laughs> and then to lose, wow, that uh, you can't even begin to. So that that's. <laughs> I'm just I'm going with fate. I'm just like it's it give you an opportunity. You know, circumstances give you an opportunity to prove who you are. And that's what we're out here to do. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's it's. Uh, I I can only imagine. It's uh, <laughs> it it just it, it's such a big. You know, it's funny when you tell people when you're on an airplane. Yeah, and look, we joked at the beginning about this executive platinum thing. You sit on an airplane a lot next to random people, and there's some of the chatty ones that want to know what you do, and you tell them you're a horse trainer, and the second question they ask you is, "Have you ever won the Kentucky Derby?" Yeah, well. Uh, if you go over 26, when they ask you what you do, say plumber. There's no <laughs> follow-up questions to I'm a plumber. I just, I, I've tried them all. That's my favorite. <laughs> I know, because like, you can, I can imagine it's just like a tough, you know, position. Well, no, I know, I know, I know. I've never won the Kentucky Derby, but I've won the Preakness. I've won the Belmont. I've won a lot of no, Breeders' yeah, Cup that, races. Those aren't even races to that guy sitting next to you. I believe. Oh, by the way, sir, I've also won 10,000 races, more than anyone else. And at that point, they're just ready to get their Tito's and soda and take a nap. Yeah, wait, yeah. Believe me, you, you know, I'm all about records. That record I'm not crazy about is the most starters in the Derby without a winner. You know, let's erase that one. Let's trade it for another one. Now, of of those twenty six, are the three that you really feel like got away from you are the are, are Epicenter, Curlin, um, and Gunrunner, or is there another one that you felt like, uh, or or do you feel like those were the three you were you were meant to win with? Yeah, I just, I I just one of the first ones we ever ran was fifty stars in the Monarco year. And the way the race unfolded, it felt like he had a nice chance. He made a huge run around the turn and then flattened out. And he chipped an ankle real bad in the race. And I felt that, you know, at that time and whatever, maybe naively, that if not for that, he might possibly could have. But I think that Curlin getting beat in any horse race was, yeah, I think that, yeah, it, it is. When you think back of all those opportunities, uh, the th you know, Epicenter last year is the one that's probably the hardest to digest. I uh, I bet Pyro. If it, <laughs> if I, if Pyro, Pyro was a horse I did not feel got a mile and a quarter at his best. And Sean always did a good job with cheating a little distance out of a race with him, you know. But he was a horse that ended up being a grade one winner at seven eighths of a mile. But it was it was it wasn't wrong to dream. But we we did knowingly suspect that he would have trouble at a mile and a quarter. All right, I got a few more horses for you, and then I, I got I got uh, a story from Keith. I got to get out of you, um, uh, Matoli. Uh, I, I I just he he was such a darn cool horse. Um, and, I, and I'm, is, I'm so hopeful. That, that was a great race to be involved with. I mean, obviously a great racehorse. He is one of my favorite. I love to watch replays of, I, you know, just not be able to sleep or whatever. Whatever reason, I love to watch 
replays and Matoli's replays, the acceleration that he can show from going fast, like his Breeders' Cup sprint win, the, there's a there's a video of the Churchill Downs handicap going seven eighths. Um, his four year old year at Churchill Downs mm-hmm. from the video from the that is on a, a wire from the inside that goes with them. When Ricardo asks him to run um, inside the eighth pole, you can see him physically accelerate from that level of speed. You don't see dirt sprinters accelerate in the stretch like Matoli was capable of doing. And his Met Mile, the watch that race. The I love the video of that of how fast he is going sub forty four. How easy he's going sub 44 and every, you know, McKenzie's run at him. Watch. It's not McKenzie's run at him. It's the other horses not keeping pace. McKenzie don't get by him galloping out even. He was, I, I am, this is his first, his babies are two, his oldest are two year olds this year. I am so excited for them because Matoli is a, unbel- a very special racehorse. Now, you didn't really take too many chances stretching him out. He was just so damn good sprinting. But, I mean, after the Met Mile, did, did, like, did you think to yourself, man, maybe this, maybe this guy will go a little further? I think I kind of remember my ignorant mind getting excited no. about maybe you trying to stretch him out for, like, the Woodward or something. Oh, the Whitney, excuse me. The Mato- Matoli's issue was he had a uh, suspensory that was – adhered to the in a hind leg and i never had any issue with it but mr uh, bill and Crin heidelbro who owned him and just you know we've had so many nice horses together i did not want to risk injuring him by putting the training that would be necessary in him to go two turns but with hot rod you know, him being by escondrea and a half to hot rod, there's no doubt that his offspring will go far enough but he had a full injury that, you know, caused scarring on a suspensory that I didn't want to risk what we were great at to see what we, you know, to see what else we could do. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely get it. And it's like the way, like you said, the way that he ran the Met Mile, it seemed like he would have gone. Oh, that I, absolutely. And, and I, that was the, as good as that race was coming off the Churchill Downs handicap, you know, as grade one. I mean, I, I wanted to prove that he could be anybody at a mile, you know, just, you know, Bill, Miss Bill and Crin Heidelbro, you, t- you know, they love their horses. They love horse racing and they like competition and, uh, you know, what a great field that was and, uh, you know, what an opportunity, but I think what else would Matoli need to prove after that race? No, not much. I just liked watching him run. He was so good. <laughs> yes, me too. Steve, we got to talk on that. We got to talk uh, the ten thousand. Um, you know, I know. You know the 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 you know breaking the record to be the winningest trainer of all time was was special in its own right. But then now you're you know you're advancing your position uh, with with ten thousand wins. Um, you know, I want to start with, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that this is something that would happen and, and how important is it that, you know, looking at this picture, holding up that 10,000 win sign from Oakland park, having your entire family, uh, with you as part of the process. Okay. Do you want an honest answer or do you want a politically (laughs) correct one? You're the honest one. I don't know what it was in the water in Laredo, Texas, that my parents, could raise two kids with the level of confidence that me and cash have from that level. But I don't know, maybe just, yes, we think we're capable of it. I mean, what, you know, it just, with that kind of support and yeah, I, yeah, I, I definitely think that we're capable of it. I, yes. That's what, it, and I think, I mean, I, Cash being my older brother probably has a tremendous amount to do with it. Um, you know, it, it's well documented. You know, my mom and dad trained, my dad rode, my mom trained horses, Ridosa, New Mexico in the summers, Laredo, Texas in the winters. 
we all know what that was for and what it was worth. And for Cash to be leading, you know, uh, as a 16-year-old, win the Eclipse as the nation's leading apprentice. I believe he was the leading rider in New York in 77, 78, probably 78, 79 in there those years. And for him to go to France, a foreign, I mean, like, how is that not enough, you know? to go to a country where you don't speak the language because, because, you know, and it, look, I, you can't be a bigger fan than Cash Asmussen than me, but I will say this, there, there seems to be some European riders that do really well in the States now that don't ride like other European riders used to before Cash went there. I mean, I, I mean, his personality is one that I think he changed the style of European riders. You, I mean, Dottori doesn't look like Yves St. Martin or Lester Piggott does on one, <laughs> right? No, of course. Sumion and them guys, they don't look like the predecessors before Cash went to Europe, do they? They kind of, their style, and the way they sit a horse, the way they put their foot in the stirrup, kind of seems like he changed the whole continent's way of riding a racehorse. That seems pretty strong to me, you know? Of course. But, you know, so, yeah, and that's my older brother. So what do you think I didn't think I was capable of after having that sort of example to follow? And, and then, Steve, you're having your three boys uh, with you there and your wife, uh, you know, I'd, I'd imagine that, that it wouldn't have probably felt the same way to not have the whole crew there. God has blessed me in that way, and I, I that you cannot make that up, can you? I mean, if you're going to pass Dale Baird and you've planned on this for at least ten or fifteen years, because you can add one and one equals two, and if I at my age I'm winning this many, who is you know? I mean, you're aware of it. I mean, we're in racing. Like <laughs> Lucas said, if they don't want stats to matter, tell them to quit counting. You know, <laughs> but. but you know, and to win, to go by Dale Baird, which is your professional lifelong dream, is to go by him, and you do it on Whitney Day at Saratoga, with a horse owned by Ron Winchell, and the which for what they've done for you with your whole family there, yeah, that I'm gonna go with divine intervention on the timing of that. Absolutely, I I, I was excited that it happened there as well. And, and, and like you said, four, four connections that, that mean so much uh, to you and the family. And uh, what about having Keith le legging him up? Did you, when you legged him up, did you think that that was, did you think that was 10,000 or, or were you a little nervous? No, um, riding Keith is separate from anything I felt in horse racing. Um, I don't know what you could liken it to, but uh the the pops, you know, it, it's it, and you know Keith Bryden is like the opportunity to ride cash when he was young. It's like turning it back, you know. Like when Cash was finishing, I was starting and he rode some for me, but I didn't have the stable that I do now, you know. And then uh, you think about it, and now it just feels like you could possibly. You know, it, it's just unique to say the least. Um, and it's, I, I, and the blessing is how talented he is. And it, a very unconventional way to go about this as in not claiming his bug. But he, he's 5'10", he does 118 and does it the right way. But just if he'd have taken out his apprenticeship and the, you know, the, what is it, 10 pounds till you win five, seven till you win 35. Just the pressure or the desire to do a weight that would be unhealthy for him, you know, at, at his height. You know, it, it, of course, that's, that is designed to get people started. But I, you know, we've discussed it. And where you end up is what matters, not where you start, you know. And for him to give away the apprentice and start, you know, doing equal weights. Yeah, that that's up against it a bit. But I think that it gets him 
at a weight that he's healthy at and that he can maintain and that he can actually improve at. Well, I, I mean, I got to say, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a big number. 10,000 10, is a lot of wins. Um, I, I, you know, I will, I will admit, you know, when getting near it and, I went 0 for 18 between 9,999 and the 10,000. And I and I believe that is to prove to you, to me, how hard it can be to win a race, you know, to make it that much more significant. But, you know, uh, Lane Stowell pointed out to me, worked for us and stuff. Do you know that 10,000, he told me one morning, he goes, do you know that 10,000 is more than winning a race a day for 27 straight years? And I'm like, wow, that's pretty impressive. You that's know, a lot nothing of else being in this, that's hard headed, right? I mean, if you can maintain anything that long, you're hard headed. I mean, it's hard to show up anywhere for 27 days, you know, 27 <laughs> years every day. Right. And then when you get, well, I'm 57 now, and I think that's what I'm proudest of. Man, you're, you can do this. You can keep doing it. You know, oh, that's outstanding. Well, Steve, I, I really appreciate it. And the, the one that I wanted to leave you with here uh, is Keith uh, told me to ask you about uh, mom braiding dash for cash. Well, I, I it was, man, that dash for, oh, I grew up in court horse racing, obviously, and stuff. Bubba Cassio had dash for cash at Ridoso, and, that, and they when they retired him and they were going to syndicate him, they brought him to... Uh, Ridosa Downs. He was stable at Los Alamitos and stuff, but when they were going to syndicate Dash for Cash, who to me is the greatest quarter horse of all time. Nothing compares to Dash for Cash and quarter horses to me at my age and who he was. Um, they were going to parade him before the All-American Yearling Sale at Ridosa Downs, and Bubba Cassio had mom who braided all her horses, which m my mother is why I braid all our manes. Uh, tribute to her and respect that's why all of our horses run with braided manes is because of my mother but she braided all of her horses manes and bubba asked her to braid dash for cash before they paraded him and mom always tagging me tagging along and taking it with me and knowing what horses like that meant to me let me had me go with her and i was holding dash for cash for my mom to braid big horse my mom's five foot tall She's standing on a, a five-gallon bucket upside down to braid his mane. She's about two braids into it. She gets off the bucket. He lowered his head all the way. So he was that intelligent of a horse. Like, even thinking about that experience when I was, I think I was 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old when it happened, was I can remember it to the moment how special that was. And what a great memory that was. Wow. That's uh they're they're magical animals, I tell you what, and it it's um and it it doesn't it doesn't shock me when I talk to people like you who have had the success you've had, um, how much you can tell you just absolutely love the horse. They make life they make life possible. I I mean and if you're an Asmussen, look what it has done for you. You know, we, me and Julie talk about it all the time. You know, just grew up in South Texas in Laredo, Webb County, you know, show, showing livestock and being in 4-H. And, you know, and the people that horse racing has put us in contact with, with and introduced us to and <laughs> tra traveled the world because of all of what a race or uh, what a horse could do for us. Steve, it's been an honor. Uh, congratulations again on 10,000, and, and we'll have to do this again. This is a lot of fun. I, I, I'm sure there's 100 more stories, and uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time, and, and hopefully we made your drive a little bit shorter. <laughs> Fabulous memories, and uh, I'm so blessed to have them. Wow, Steve, thank you so much for the time. That was, uh, that was a ton of fun. I had to, had to reach for the Kleenex a few times uh, in the middle of that. Um, ah, it, it, it's, it's always so fun to, to hear the, the behind the scenes stories of some of our favorite horses, but it's also, you know, I, I love, um, I love hearing just kind of like the, you know, we would call it in coaching kind of like, uh, 
chalk talk, like hearing the kind of behind the scenes thinking that these trainers have when they're making these decisions. Um, and hearing some of the, 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 the strategy when it came to curling was, that was, I, I had never heard those stories before. And, and that was, uh, that was really cool. Um, so I want to thank Steve, uh, for taking the time. Tom Lute, my buddy, Tom Lute sent me a couple of questions, uh, to ask, uh, ask Steve. I appreciate that. Keith Asmussen, his son as well. I appreciate it. Thank you again to, to our friends at Qatar Racing, Sheikh Fahad, uh, for the support of this podcast. And um, this is that time where I, I, I say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you to PTF, to Drew, um, Matty Ice, Matt Bernier, Spencer, uh, Michelle and Billy, Maggie. Hmm. I'm forgetting somebody, aren't I? I think I am. Nick Tamro's on our shows a lot. Thanks, Nick. Nikki the boss. And thank you to all of you for listening. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, some video ones coming soon. Just working out some details. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, Angel Cordero is going to be one of them. And it uh, might break the internet. We uh, appreciate your support. Make sure you follow, subscribe, retweet, post, like, comment, all that good stuff. We'll see you next week. I need to know everything. Who in the what and the where I need everything. Trust me, I hear what you're saying, but I like it's new what you're telling me. I'm curious, George. I hop in the Porsche. There's five on a horse. I'm ready for war. I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost. I need to know everything. Now you be surprised at the info you get is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk.